in order for some of us to wake up, we need a wake-up call. And in 1986, I got the call. I was in a triathlon in Palm Springs, California, and I was in the biking portion of the race. And I was coming up to this intersection, and there were two cyclists that were turning uh, onto uh, another road. And there was a police officer that was standing on the opposite side, and he was pointing at me, and he was telling me to turn and to merge uh, uh, onto this road. And so I was locked in on him, and I wasn't paying attention uh, to, to the road. And the problem was he had his back to the oncoming traffic. So as I made the turn, a four-wheel drive Bronco going about 55 miles an hour hit me from behind and catapulted me out of my bicycle. And I landed on my lower back and my buttocks. And I th when you land very hard, uh, the compressive force basically puts a, a downward pressure on the vertebrae. And uh, the compressive force compressed six vertebrae in my spine, the eighth thoracic vertebrae, the ninth thoracic vertebrae, 10, 11, 12, and the first lumbar vertebrae. And when you compress volume like that, the matter has to go somewhere. And in my case, it went back towards my spinal cord. One of the vertebrae, the uh, eighth thoracic vertebrae, was more than 60% collapsed, and the neural arch that where the spinal cord passed through had broken like a pretzel. So I had multiple compression fractures of my thoracic spine and upper lumbar spine. I had bone fragments on my spinal cord, and I had compression of the cord uh, because of the neural arch uh, being fractured. And so they took me to the hospital and... Uh, uh, I had four opinions from four of the leading surgeons in Southern California, and the prognosis was I'd probably never walk again, uh, and that uh, I needed a radical surgery called the Harrington Rod Surgery. And in Harrington Rod Surgery, they basically cut off the back parts of your vertebrae. They screw in these long stainless steel rods, and by screwing those rods in there, they cantilever and pull the spinal column off the spinal cord and it opens up a pathway. And then they take bone fragments from your hip and they paste it over the top and they hope for the best. So in my case, it would be from the base of my neck to the base of my spine because of the number of vertebrae that were compressed. And so um, I think that if this had been anybody else, I probably would have recommended that they have the surgery. Uh, but this was me. And I wasn't so quick uh, based on the x-rays and the CAT scans and MRIs to just decide to have the surgery. And so um, I think one of the biggest things about <clears throat> making a choice when you're, in, when you're indecisive, it's, uh, it's, uh, it's one of the difficult times because you're weighing what you know against what you don't know. And you reach this point in your life where it's like a dark night of the soul because when you realize that nobody has the answers to your problems but you, then you start this process of stepping out into the unknown. Now, in 1986, in Southern California, not a lot of people were going against convention, whether it was scientific convention or medical convention or social convention or religious convention. But I think that when you step outside of convention, that's the definition of a miracle. So when you do something like that, you're always considered foolhardy or insane until you pull it off, and then you're a saint or a mystic or a genius. So I decided for myself personally that I was willing to step out into the unknown, that I couldn't imagine myself uh, living on addictive medications for the rest of my life or being in a wheelchair. And so <clears throat> I decided to check out of the hospital, and I just had this one thought, and the thought was the power that made the body heals the body. And I couldn't stop thinking about that because I knew that there's an intelligence that's giving us life that keeps our heart beating and digesting our food. And that consciousness is awareness, and awareness is paying attention. So it must be observing or paying attention to who I am. So I decided that I was going to make contact with this intelligence. And I was going to give it a plan, a template, a design. I was going to get very specific on what I wanted. And when I was happy with my creation, I was going to surrender this creation to a greater mind because it, knew, it knows how to heal way better than I do. Uh, and the second thing I said was I'm not going to let any thought slip by my awareness that I don't want to experience. Now, this sounds really easy 
from an intellectual standpoint, but I learned very quickly that I couldn't get my mind to do what I wanted it to do. And, and when we're in crisis like, uh, or trauma, like I was, we tend to focus on what we don't want to have happen instead of what we do want to have happen. So out of the infinite potentials that exist for us as human beings, I was selecting the worst case scenario over and over again in my mind and embracing that emotionally and being prepared for that event because if anything less happened, I would have better chances of survival. And I think when we're in crisis, it's those survival chemicals, those hormones of stress that prepare us for the worst case scenario. So uh, I would start off in my mind reconstructing my spine vertebrae per vertebrae and then I'd start thinking about living in a wheelchair and then I'd become aware that I was focusing on what I don't want to have happen instead of what I do want to have happen and I'd stop and realize that I'd have to start all over and the reason being was because this intelligence is a presence and just like when you know someone is present with you they're paying attention to you and you know when they're not and they're distracted so I reasoned that I had to be completely present with it and it had to get a very clear signal a very clear plan so I would start all over again and start reconstructing my spine and then I'd start thinking about should I sell my home should I sell my practice and I'd stop again become conscious and then I'd get frustrated and then I'd get impatient and then I'd get angry and then it would just get worse and so for six weeks, I went through this incredible dark night of the soul because I couldn't really get my mind to do what I wanted it to do. And it would take me about three hours in closing my eyes and reconstructing every single vertebrae and starting over again every time I lost my attention. And then I was never satisfied really with the way, it was, um, the way I did it, but I would just keep going. At the end of six weeks... <clears throat> I went through the whole entire process without losing my attention, and it was like I hit a tennis ball in the sweet spot. Something clicked in that moment. I clicked, and I knew in that moment that something happened, and what was taking me three hours to do, I was able to do in 45 minutes, and at the time, I didn't know it, but I was firing and wiring new circuits in my brain every single day. And I was literally improving my ability to pay attention. And attention is a skill, just like golf or tennis. The more you practice it, the better you get at it. So I wasn't going anywhere. I wasn't doing anything. I was basically laying face down, and I had a lot of time on my hands. So this was the object of my affection. At that time, when I was able to go through that whole rehearsal, I started noticing significant changes in my body. My pain levels dropped and diminished immediately. Uh, uh, the, some of the neurological problems I was having were improving, numbness, tingling. My motor functions started coming back. And the moment I correlated what I was doing inside of me with the effect that I was producing outside of me, I started paying attention to what I was doing and did it with, with more passion and more enthusiasm instead of dread and frustration. And it was that elevated emotion that I started to realize that was actually the catalyst to make it fun and easy. And then I just started thinking about if I, ever able, if I was ever able to walk again, if I, what, what did I take for granted, like a sunset or a shower or sitting with my friends and enjoying a meal? And all of a sudden, I started selecting potentials in the quantum field that were no longer based on the worst-case scenario, but really some future possibility. And I began to emotionally embrace and experience it completely, whether it was a sunset on the beach or uh, a shower, I would live it and emotionally feel it. And I didn't know what I was doing at the time, but I think when you combine a clear intention with an elevated emotion, you move your body and brain from living in the past to living in the future. And the brain and body actually don't know the difference when you're truly focused and paying attention between what's going on in your outer world and what's going on in your inner world. And the very process of the elevated emotion began to convince my body that I was living in that future reality in the present moment because the body's the unconscious mind that doesn't know the difference. That I began to signal new genes in new ways and my body began to change dramatically. And, and um, I was back on my feet in 10 weeks and um, back training again at 12 weeks and I you know, never have any pain in my body or in my back. And, and um, I just made a deal with myself, and the deal was if, with this intelligence that uh, 
if I was ever able to walk again, I'd spend the rest of my life studying the mind-body connection and mind over matter. And pretty much that's what I've been doing since 1986. Amazing.